Uh, this evening, I'm joined by uh, two other colleagues on the energy program, Grace Andrews and Neil Bonsgaard, who are going to be helping out behind the scenes here, but I wanted to acknowledge that um, they do a lot of hard work on this program too. All right, so um, we can go on to the next slide. I just wanted to give you a quick introduction to the Environmental Center for any of those new faces out there. Um, we are a hub of sustainability here in Central Oregon. And Neil, you can go to the next one. And uh, our mission is to um, embed sustainability into daily life in Central Oregon through unique programs, strategic partnerships, and uh, community outreach. Sorry about that. So our um, work began with a handful of people now um, almost 30 years ago in the center of Bend. And since then, um, we've grown to become a regional leader in environmental, excuse me, in environmental education and engagement. Um, we try to inspire folks to action um, and we work alongside all sorts of uh, folks in the community, people of all ages, local businesses, and elected officials to try to create and advocate for meaningful change here in Central Oregon. Uh, so we do that through educating kids, inspiring adults, advancing change, and hopefully shaping uh, this place that we call home. And we believe in this quest for creating this um, better place to live right here in Central Oregon is um, really important and it can all start with you. And that's why um, we're really excited about this um, Power Hour series that we have going on uh, because we're hoping to engage with folks in the community to have some real conversations and dialogue to build a baseline understanding of how can we actually produce uh, renewable energy in our own backyards, in our region, and uh, for other communities in Oregon, how we can actually start to dig in and uh, figure out what sources of, of um, renewable energy could actually power our communities. Uh, so this series that we're working on, uh, we're calling Homegrown Renewables, and it's a special uh, series of our Power Hour event lineup this spring. We're going to focus on um, a whole host of um, renewable energy sources, such as geothermal, which we're digging into tonight, as well as biomass, um, in conduit hydro and irrigation modernization, uh, as well as solar. And um, we're really hoping, again, that this can be the beginning of a conversation as we start to look at how we can produce renewable energy right here in um, Central Oregon. And this is especially timely because the city of Bend is looking at how um, we can produce 100% of our energy with renewable energy sources. And uh, we are starting to kick off some grassroots planning to put together a Deschutes County energy plan and are currently doing an inventory of where we get our energy from and how we get and how we use energy so that we can put together a comprehensive plan of where we'd like to see our energy, um, our energy production go in the future. And so this will be a great place for us all to come together and learn so that we can engage in um, conversations about setting those goals for our community. Uh, so that's all I have for you. I'm going to uh, pass it off to one of our partners at Sustainable Northwest, Bridget Callahan, uh, who's going to just give you a quick overview of their Making Energy Work Coalition and how uh, this feeds into some of the work that they're doing and introduce our speakers. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, nice to be here today, nice to see everyone. Uh, I'm Bridget Callahan, I'm the Senior Energy Program Manager for Sustainable Northwest. We're a, a regional natural resource conservation organization and I'm very excited about the work happening in Central Oregon and um, partnering with the Environmental Center to advance some of those initiatives that Lindsay had mentioned specifically around energy planning for the county. Um, and at our organization, we work to really advanced community energy projects across the Northwest. And part of that is convening a coalition called Making Energy Work. And um, we it's a, a coalition that's comprised of pretty diverse groups of folks from across the state, rural municipalities, tribes, nonprofits, conservation uh, districts, uh, a whole smattering of folks all working towards clean energy projects, programs, and development. But we come together, we have statewide quarterly calls, 
and an annual fall energy symposium. And we'd like to think of this, this coalition as kind of an innovation incubator where if we see some uh, kind of interesting project that's successful that takes place, this coalition learns about it and then replicates that into other communities. So we're trying to glean off the good work that's happening in Deschutes County and be able to scale and replicate that across the state, including the, the energy plan itself. Um, so that's enough about us. I would like to go ahead and just kick off uh, our first speaker tonight. This is uh, pleased to introduce Daniel, Dr. Daniel McKay. At, she's an adjunct instructor at the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Oregon. She lives in Bend and teaches online geology courses throughout the academic year and field courses in Central Oregon during the summer. Her research background is in physical volcanology with a focus on recent mafic eruptions uh, in the Central Oregon Cascades. She's also interested in how societies prepare for and respond to natural disasters, especially volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. So she's worked for um, Deschutes County, the Oregon Office of Emer Emergency Management, Oregon Partnership for Disaster Resilience, and the Red Cross on Natural Hazard Mi Preparedness and Mitigation in Central Oregon. So Dr. Daniel McKay, we're really happy to have you here tonight. I'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, let me just share my screen. All right, if there's any problems with seeing these slides, um, I'm sure someone will let me know. So I'm just gonna give a brief overview of geothermal energy, just kind of what it is and what the different types are. Um, and I, I think this is maybe mostly just to set the stage for the discussion. And also I noticed that geothermal energy quite often doesn't even get mentioned in sort of the, um, the handful of renewable energy um, resources that are out there. You hear about wind and solar quite a bit. Um, geothermal, not as much. So hopefully this will kind of um, set the stage and answer some of the questions that people might have about geothermal energy. And this slide is a picture from Iceland. This is a geothermal power plant in Iceland where they're taking hot water out of the ground and they're turning turbines with it. We will talk about that in a few slides. So they're actually generating electricity using hot water. But also, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, there are these pipes that are coming out of the plant. And once that hot water has been used to turn turbines and generate electricity, it's still hot water. It's not hot enough to generate power, but it is still hot water. And it's piped to Reykjavik, which is the capital of Iceland. And that hot water is then run through radiators and it supplies heat to everyone's homes. Um, it melts ice off of the streets. It goes to swimming pools people's showers. So not only are they generating power at this power plant, they're also supplying all domestic hot water to the capital. Um, and that's common throughout Iceland. So geothermal energy can be used in a variety of ways. And we'll talk about some of those in a few minutes. Um, but first, just a little introduction um, to, to the earth. <laughs> so you're probably uh, have seen images like this before of the layers of the planet. There's the core in the center of the planet the mantle, and then we live on this very thin veneer on the surface of the planet, which is the crust. And the estimated temperature of the core is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, about the same temperature as the surface of the sun. The estimated temperature of the mantle, which makes up most of the volume of the planet, it varies from about 1600 degrees Fahrenheit up here towards the surface. Um, to about 7,000, a little higher degrees Fahrenheit down towards the core. And together, the core and the mantle make up 99% of Earth's volume. 84% of, of that is in the mantle, 15% of that is in the core. So the whole point here is there is a lot of heat in the Earth and we are not going to um, use up all of this heat, no matter how much energy um, we extract from geothermal power, um, we would never use up the, the heat of the earth. Um, all right, so next slide. Um, so a geothermal reservoir, when you, when you hear about geothermal energy, um, oftentimes you hear about this term reservoir. And a geothermal reservoir is not the same thing as a reservoir of water. We think of reservoirs, uh, a place where maybe you dammed a river, and that dam backs up uh, a lake, a man-made lake. 
Um, so in that sense of the term, reservoir is a big pool of water. Uh, in the geothermal sense, reservoir is not a big underground pool of water that's deep under, you know, under the earth. Instead, it refers to fractures and cracks in the ground. So in this image, uh, here's the surface of the earth, rain and snow is falling. Some of that water is gonna run off as surface water into rivers and streams, but some of it will find its way down through fractures and cracks in the earth. And as you go deeper into the earth, it gets hotter everywhere you go on the planet. The deeper you go, the hotter it gets. So as that water percolates down and it's not getting anywhere near the mantle, this is all in the crust of the earth. Um, but as it goes down, it the rocks are warmer. Um, this image is drawn to kind of imply that there's like a big magma chamber down there. That's not the case. This is just implying that the rocks are getting warmer and warmer, but not that they're molten. Um, so the water percolates down and as it gets into hotter and hotter rock, that water heats up and eventually it comes back up and it might come all the way back up to the surface and that's a hot spring or a geyser or some um, manifestation of, of geothermal hot water on the surface of the earth. But most of that water just stays down, deep down underground. So that term geothermal reservoir actually implies three different things. You have to have these three different things in order to have a geothermal reservoir. One is hot rock and everywhere on the planet, if you go deep enough, there's hot rock. The second is water. And the third is fractures in the rock. If there's no fractures in the rock, then that water can't percolate around and get heated up. So the more fractured this area is, the larger the geothermal reservoir. The more cracks and fractures that there are, the more water there is percolating through and the more hot water you end up with. So keep that in, your, in the back of your mind as we talk about um, geothermal reservoirs and geothermal um, power. These are the three things that you have to have, hot rock, water and fractured rock. So here's just kind of a poor resolution image, um, but it's showing a geothermal reservoir as like a, like a geothermal engineer would think about it. You have an injection well where you've drilled down and you've pumped in some cold water. You have a geothermal reservoir, which means there's hot rock here. The, and it's, again, this isn't a magma chamber. The rock is only hot because you go deep enough down into the earth. Um, and you have fractures in that rock. And the cold water that you've pumped down percolates through these fractures and then you can drill another well, a production well, and you can take that now hot water out of your geothermal reservoir and you can use it to generate power. So if we look at a map of the US, um, this shows, let's see, move some things around on my screen so I can see all of this slide. Um, so this shows the estimated temperatures at depths of about six kilometers or about 3.7 miles everywhere across the United States. So if you drilled anywhere in the US and you went down deep enough, about six kilometers, these are the temperatures that you would encounter. And so here in the West, we have a lot of volcanic activity. We think of this area as being great for geothermal, but we think of the rest of the US as being not so great for geothermal. And that is true. If you drill down in most parts of Oregon, um, you don't have to drill as far to get as high temperatures. And if you drill the complete six kilometers that's showing, shown in this map, you would get temperatures greater than 200 degrees Celsius in many parts of Oregon. But even if you go out here into the Midwest and parts of the East Coast, you can drill down six kilometers and still get fairly high temperatures. So we have a vast geothermal resource across the United States and the rest of the world is, is similar to this. Um, all right, so uh, just a, kind of an overview of how geothermal energy is used, um, a variety of purposes. It can be used to produce power and that's really what the rest of these slides will focus on. So that's to generate electricity. Uh, it can be used as a heat source. Hot water can be run through radiators to heat residential, commercial or industrial buildings, sort of what I was talking about in Iceland. It can be used for aquaculture or horticulture. Um, hot water can be used to raise fish that require warmer water temperatures than what you have um, in rivers and streams and also used to heat greenhouses. Um, so these photos are all from Iceland and they just show examples of all of this. Uh, these tanks raising fish that aren't, um, that wouldn't live in Iceland normally that need warmer water are all heated with geothermal um, water. That doesn't mean they're hot, 
but they're warm enough for whatever species of fish they're raising. And then you also can commonly see greenhouses in Iceland where they're growing food like tomatoes and cucumbers that wouldn't really do well in that environment normally, but they're growing them in greenhouses that are heated with geothermal energy. Um, all right, so we're gonna focus on power, generating power, extracting that energy and actually generating el electricity. Um, so geothermal energy is extracted by drilling into rock that is hot. You have to have those high temperatures and also fractured. You have to have high porosity or high, and high permeability. Porosity refers to the amount of uh, space that's in that rock, little holes in the rock. And permeability refers to the connectivity of those holes. So if you have a lot of holes in the rock, but none of them are connected, that's not gonna work for a geothermal reservoir. There have to be connected fractures and connected holes that that water can percolate through. Um, so again, this is sort of those three ingredients that you must have in order to have a geothermal reservoir. So if groundwater exists in the rock layers, that groundwater is just pumped to the surface. You just drill a well and take out the hot water that already exists. Um, if groundwater does not exist in the area, then water or other fluids can be pumped into those rock layers where they're heated. And that's what this image here is showing. Um, there's no groundwater in this area, but there is hot rock and the rock is fractured. So cold water is pumped down, it percolates through those fractures, it heats up, and then the hot water is pulled back up and used to generate electricity. Um, and the techniques used for power generation depends on the state of that hot fluid that, that you're taking up. Is it liquid? Is it gas? Or you can think of it, is it really hot water or is it steam? Um, and those techniques used for power generation are either dry steam power plants, flash steam power plants, binary cycle power plants, and then we will, and we'll look at each of those individually. And then we will also look at this enhanced geothermal systems. What are those? Um, that's not a means of power production. That's actually a means of creating a geothermal reservoir. So let's look at each of those individually. Um, all right, so dry steam power plants and flash steam power plants. These are used in volcanic areas where temperatures are hot. You don't have to drill down as far in order to encounter these high temperatures. Um, so I have this image here, hot water or steam is taken out of the earth. It exists there already. Um, and that's, it's just taken out of the earth and it's used to turn a turbine. So uh, a well is drilled. Hopefully you can all see my cursor here. Hot water is, comes out, it's extracted out of that geothermal reservoir. Um, it goes into a tank where it's either, either it comes out as steam or it's flashed to steam. The, the water might've come out as a liquid, um, but then we turn it into steam um, because of the reduction of pressure. And that steam drives a turbine. And this part is the same as almost every other power plant on the planet. Coal-fired power plants, oil and gas-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, they're all heating up water. The reason that we're burning coal or burning oil or gas or, burn, or um, separating nuclear fissionable material, the reason we're doing that is to generate heat and that heat is used to heat up water at, to steam and the steam is used to turn a turbine. So once we get that hot water out of the ground, this power plant is essentially the same as any other power plant. The steam turns a turbine, the turbine generates electricity, which goes out to the grid, which is represented here over on the right. And then that steam is sent into a condenser, which looks like a cooling tower. And these cooling towers can look like cooling towers at any other power plant. They can look like, Cooling towers that you think of as being nuclear cooling towers, but you also see them at coal-fired power plants and a variety of other types of plants. And all that tower is doing is just allowing the steam to condense back to water. So it's going from a gas steam to a liquid water. And then that liquid water is pumped back down into the geothermal reservoir so that it can heat back up by that hot rock. Um, so that's the basics for generating power from, from geothermal um, water, from hot water. And the heat source for these systems is inexhaustible for as long as volcanic activity continues, which on our time scales, on a geologic time scale, the volcanic activity might stop. But on human time scales, that's usually, you know, indefinite, um, so sort of as far as we can see into the future. All right, so dry steam power plants and flash steam power plants. Um, both used in volcanic areas where temperatures are high, and in both types, the hot steam or water comes directly out of the ground and goes through the turbines. So in one case, you have hot steam coming out of the ground, 
the steam turns the turbine, generates electricity, and then my favorite sort of uh, visual for generating electricity, a giant light bulb, <laughs> uh, that just goes out into the power, power grid. And then the cold water is pumped back down into the ground. In flash steam power plants, the hot water comes out um, as hot water, it's not steam, it's flash to steam, the steam turns the turbines and everything else is exactly the same and that water is pumped down into the ground. So the benefits of these types of power plants is that the heat source is inexhaustible. Greenhouse gas emissions are very low compared to burning fossil fuels. There are some greenhouse gas emissions, but they're incredibly low compared to fossil fuels. The drawbacks are that the temperatures must be greater than 360 degrees Fahrenheit. You can deplete the water supply and this, uh, this or this um, generation of power can leave some deposits on pipes and turbines um, and, and emit some carbon dioxide and also hydrogen sulfide, methane, ammonia, and trace amounts of other materials that in concentrations, in high concentrations, they, they aren't healthy. Um, so here's an image of a pipe that has deposits from this type of power production. It does leave deposits on pipes and turbines and turbines in particular are very expensive. And so this is not something that geothermal engineers wanna see is their pipes and their turbines caked up with these deposits that the hot water has left behind as it comes up. Um, so that's one of the biggest drawbacks of dry steam and flash steam power plants is that it's just really hard on expensive equipment. In terms of, um, the amount of you know, potentially toxic materials. This is a big concern um, for a lot of people when geothermal power is suggested you know, as, a, as a means of producing electricity in their area. And that's these small amounts of things like ammonia and methane and um, other toxic elements like mercury and arsenic. Um, so this is an image of the Blue Lagoon in Iceland, which is a geothermal pool. People go there to soak in the water and this is kind of like, you know, gorgeous photo of like an ad for the, the Blue Lagoon. But if we could back up out of this image and look at what the Blue Lagoon really is, it's a geothermal power plant. And the hot water that's used to turn the turbines is then poured out into this lava flow to cool. And that's what the Blue Lagoon is. It is the, the cooling water from a geothermal power plant. And yes, it does have all of this stuff in it, but it's in such low concentrations that it's not unhealthy. And in fact, there's a lot of research um, going on at the Blue Lagoon that shows that this is all actually really good for your skin. Um, it clears up skin disorders like psoriasis. Um, all right, so the other type of power plant that we're gonna talk about is a binary cycle power plant. And this can be used in volcanic areas and non-volcanic areas where temperatures are lower. And in this type of power plant, the hot water or the steam from the ground, it's, it comes up, but it never encounters, comes up through a pipe, but then it never encounters the turbine or any other equipment. Instead, there's um, a heat exchanger here. So there's a working fluid, usually something like butane, that's run through this upper part of, of the power plant. So hot water or steam comes up, it supplies heat to heat the working fluid, and that second fluid, the working fluid, is flashed to steam, turns a turbine, and that generates electricity. So this is a closed cycle. The hot water comes up out of the ground and then is immediately pumped back down into the ground. There is no contact with any other part of the power plant or with the atmosphere. Um, so the benefits of this is that the heat source is inexhaustible. It doesn't rely on high temperatures. Power plants can be located in non-volcanic areas. Um, greenhouse gas emissions are much lower than dry steam or flash steam systems. So again, if we look at this map of you, the United States, binary power plants, the type that's turning that, that working fluid, um, they don't need high temperatures because of the working fluid. So power plants can be located in non-volcanic areas. They need temperatures of about 85 to 170 degrees Celsius, which is in this yellow and orange range. And you can see in the map that that's most of the United States that has temperatures that high, if you drill down deep enough. And then I only have a few minutes left, um, but I'm just gonna very quickly cover enhanced geothermal systems or EGS. These are also sometimes called engineered geothermal systems. This is not a type of power production. This is actually a way to generate a geothermal reservoir. Once you make the geothermal reservoir at depth, the power production can be the binary plant or any other of the plants that we just went over. 
So enhanced geothermal systems are actually creating your own geothermal reservoir. So very deep wells are drilled down into rock that is hot because you drill down deep enough, um, but not necessarily because there's any volcanic activity. And that rock, so all you have is hot rock. You don't have a geothermal reservoir. You have no water and you have no fractures. You just have hot rock. And hot rock, remember, exists everywhere if you drill deep enough. So that rock is fractured. And the way it's fractured is water is pumped down under high pressure into the rock. It fractures or cracks the rock, which is represented here in this circle. And then you can send more water down there. That water can percolate around in the fractures that you just created and then heat up and you can pull it up and generate power. And that's the reason these are called enhanced or engineered geothermal systems, because we are engineering or enhancing the fractures down there at depth. Um, once that is all done, then the power plant can be any of these types of power plants that we just talked about. So the benefits of this, of EGS, is that the heat source is inexhaustible. Power plants can be located in non-volcanic areas, really anywhere on the planet. Um, or most places, and greenhouse gas emissions are very low. The drawbacks are that in some locations, an external water source is needed. You need water to pump down there, and then you also need water to heat up to create your geothermal reservoir. And this requires induced seismicity, which is man-made earthquakes, to fracture the rock. And that's really one of the key um, problems that people have with EGS, is this idea of generating earthquakes in order to fracture the rock. Um, and I don't have time, we can maybe in the questions and answers, look at a few more of these slides. I don't have time to get into all the details of this. But one thing that I will say is that those earthquakes are very, very small, um, too small to be felt by people um, and much too small to cause any damage. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because I don't wanna take up too much of my time, but we can come back to some of this in the questions and answers. Great, thank you so much, Dr. McKay. I have a, a million questions, but uh, looking forward to a lively Q&A at the end. Um, so next I would like to introduce Joshua Reed, who's a project manager with Energy Trust of Oregon's Renewable Energy Program. Uh, Energy Trust is an independent nonprofit. They're established to administer the public purpose charge, um, which are funds from Oregon's investor-owned utilities to help deliver clean, affordable energy to those utility rate player, payers. Um, he works in, with the other renewables team, which supports the development and installation of non-solar renewable energy projects. So they provide incentives for qualified hydropower, biopower, biogas, biomass, geothermal, electricity, and municipal owned community wind power projects. So Joshua, thank you for being with us today and I'll hand it over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks for reminding me to uh, participate. Um, I'm going to get my screen up here. Uh, we see in my PowerPoint there. Yeah, it looks good. OK, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me um, to participate in this conversation. Um, and I'm just going to you know, share a little bit about some of the projects we've been able to work with and help support um, in Oregon. Uh, just add a quick note that throughout this uh, slideshow, I've added some photos from one of those uh, installations. Um, just kind of cool to see how it all came together. So this is actually from one of those sites. Um, this is a cooling tower with, I, I don't know which mountain that is in the background, but it's a, <laughs> it's in Oregon. Um, <clears throat> just a real quick preview. Um, I'll just do a super quick um, review of energy, overview of Energy Trust and what we do. Um, and then a little bit of information about our in, uh, renewable energy program incentives. Um, and then I'll get into a little more detail on these two uh, geothermal uh, power projects that we were able to, um, to be involved with and help um, provide some incentives for. Um, I'll summarize kind of those incentives overall and then just talk a little bit, bit about our um, perspective um, after doing some work with uh, geothermal projects in Oregon. So yeah, um, 
Bridget basically summarized it um, for you, so I'm not going to go over it too much. But yeah, we we administer that public pur purpose charge, um, serving the investor-owned utilities, uh, and you know to to bring clean, affordable power to to all those customers. Um, just a little note about our renewables program. Uh, <clears throat> All of our funding for renewables comes from the investor owned electric utilities. And so our incentives we pay for renewables are uh, must benefit the ratepayers of those utilities. So in that case, we're limited to Portland General Electric and Pacific Power, which you can see on the map here are the, the green and kind of mustard color, um, the solid colors. And <clears throat> so, our incentives have to either, you know, that power has to be delivered to one of these utilities or, um, you know, through wheeling arrangements or, uh, or net metered within their service territory to qualify for our incentives. Um, another eligibility uh, criteria is um, it's renewable electricity generation less than 20 megawatts. Um, and I'll get into a little bit why that um, has somewhat limited our uh, our involvement with geothermal a little later in the presentation. Um, but yeah, the technologies we uh, support are listed there, which includes geothermal. Um, we offer two main types of incentives, which are project development assistance for uh, non-capital cost development work. Um, you know, all those different kinds of, of, of things you need to do just to get a project uh, off the ground and up to the point where you can install it. And then we have installation incentives um, where we're allowed to pay up to 100% of the above market costs um, of, of the energy from that project. Little detail on our history of our involve, um, involvement with geothermal. Um, we've provided project development assistance to about 20 projects uh, throughout Energy Trust history. And then we've been able to provide installation incentives for two projects. Uh, those are both at the Oregon Institute of Technology, which were basically done in uh, two phases that I'll get into more detail here. Um, but first, before... Um, a little deeper detail, we'll just do a little overview of um, of geothermal uh, power at Oregon Tech. Um, go Owls, by the way. I, I went to the or, uh, Wilsonville um, campus, but I'm also an owl myself. Uh, they've used the geothermal resource for heating since 1964. Um, and so this was one of the first uses of the binary cycle technology um, that we just learned about in the US for a geothermal power application. So that allowed um, them to take advantage of the resource at this site, which is on the lower temperature side, um, but to still uh, use it to, to make renewable energy, renewable electricity. They have uh, about two megawatts of capacity between the two projects. Um, and as we also just learned about, the discharge uh, geothermal water after it's used to make power is still used for heating on the campus. So a little more detail on phase one was uh, commissioned in 2010. It's a 280 kilowatt organic Rankin cycle, which is uh, that binary cycle technology. Um, that uses a, a working fluid that has a boiling point, you know, much lower than water. Um, so it, it, that hot uh, geothermal water can um, boil that working fluid to, to spin a turbine. Um, they had three wells available at this time, providing up to 980 GPM uh, gallons per minute of, of 195 degree Fahrenheit water. Um, you can see the total project cost and what we were able to provide there. Um, and this was estimated to create an annual generation of about 669 megawatt hours. 
and save them about $23,000 per year in energy costs. This uh, here is a picture of, you know, the, um, the main power plant building is on the right there and a small cooling tower um, on the left side where that working fluid is cooled back down and condensed to, to reuse in the cycle. Just a couple photos, these are kind of old. I, I was digging through some, some older documents here to put this together. Um, we have just some pictures of some of the components right in the middle there at the top is the main power plant, um, the ORC module that generate and generator that generates the electricity. And then on the left, there's a cooling water pump that take, takes that cooling water um, out to the cooling tower and then the geothermal water strainer. Um, I, I don't know, I'm admitting I'm not an expert on all this, but I, I know there, as, um, as we just heard, there's some um, potentially sediments and things in the, uh, in the water. So there's a strainer involved there. Moving on to phase two of their geothermal um, project. This is the second geothermal installation that was commissioned in 2015. And it's very similar, although it's just scaled up. Um, they have two one megawatt ORC units. Um, there was a new geothermal well that was drilled to uh, increase the, the resource available um, up to uh, 2,500 gallons per minute. Not any um, hotter, but uh, more volume um, and so therefore more heat. Um, so altogether, these two are 1.75 megawatt capacity, uh, much higher costs you can see. Um, and we were able to provide a, a much larger incentive for this. Um, but you see the generation is also um, much higher and um, the savings as well. They've also been able to use, um, you know, other funding sources and grants um, the, the Department of Energy and Pacific Power both provided grants on this installation. Um, and you can see here the bigger, uh, this is during construction. There's the power plant building on the left with the two units inside, and then the larger cooling tower on the right. Couple photos, uh, you see the two power plants. Now it's uh, interesting that these were um, sort of a novel um, configuration. They, they put the two in series. Um, so the geothermal fluid would go through those two units in series to be able to extract um, more, more heat from, from the same volume of water. Uh, on the left, you can see just to compare the, the scale that you're working with, with the, the cooling water pumps. There's two and they're much bigger than the other system. Um, and this is just a interesting photo I found of one of the uh, injection well vaults. So just a summary of uh, what Energy Trust was able to support these projects with. Um, both phase one and phase two um, received project development assistance for you know feasibility studies and, and other development work. And, um, and then both got an installation incentive. So altogether, we were able to provide about 2.1 million between both of these projects. Um, so yeah, I'll just um, summarize some quick, um, quick thoughts, uh, observations through our uh, history with working with these projects. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges and some limitations to us being able to, to do a lot of work with geothermal. Um, you know, it, it tends to be the most expensive form of renewable energy um, technology that we support at Energy Trust um, and also more speculative for, um, you know, project developers there's a lot less certainty of, of the outcome of uh, some of that development work. Um, and our involvement is also somewhat limited because of just the um, projects tend to benefit from economies of scale and the scale that these types of projects need to, to be financially feasible um, can challenge our, our limit of, be, of uh, being able to fund smaller than 20 megawatt systems. And of course we have a limited <laughs> renewable energy budget um, 
but we're seeing interest in this uh, as a you know a base load renewable technology that could also potentially provide resilience benefits on a community scale and um, you know we're starting to try to identify and, and coordinate um, additional funding sources for these types of projects as as they may um, continue to develop. So I know that was quick. Uh, here's another cool picture of both um, power plants side by side. On the left side, you see the smaller uh, power plant building with the small cooling tower right behind it. And then on the right side of the picture, there's the larger power plant and the cooling tower all the way to the right, sort of behind that building. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, thanks for uh, your attention and for inviting me to participate. Um, you know, feel free to contact me um, anytime to talk about potential projects and how we might be able to help. Um, and yeah, thanks a lot. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Josh. All right, well, I would like to invite folks now if they have questions to continue adding them in the chat. And we have a few questions that have come in. So I'm going to start um, with some of those and um, we can go from there. All right. Uh, so we had a question come in uh, while Danielle was speaking at the beginning. Um, what is meant by flash to steam? Are there other energy inputs that are needed to flash the hot water? Yeah, good question. Um, there's no other energy inputs that are needed. I, um, if I can just share this really quickly, um, I don't know if that's allowed or not. <laughs> uh, this is, so, that, so that, that question gets at the, the phase diagram of water essentially, which is what you're looking at. And it just, we're here living on the surface of the earth. We think of water um, and steam being controlled by temperature, but they are just as much controlled by pressure. Um, so whether water is a solid, a liquid, or a gas is just as much a control of pressure as temperature. That's all this diagram is saying. And so here, if you have, I turn my cursor into a giant pointer. Hopefully you guys can all see this. If water is at 100 degrees Celsius, that's the boiling point of water, right? In our world here at the surface of the planet. So if water exists at 100 degrees Celsius, it's going to be water vapor. It's going to be steam. But that as I move up through this diagram, pressure is increasing. So that's the equivalent of going deeper down into the earth, right? Pressure gets greater and greater and greater the deeper you go into the earth. So water that exists at depth in the earth can actually be, it's at very high pressure and it can be much over hundred degrees Celsius and still be liquid, it's not steam. So when we say it's flash to steam, that just means you're bringing up this fluid, it's super hot. It can be up to 374 degrees or, or even hotter depending on how deep it's coming from. You bring it up to the surface of the earth and then you can spray it into this, um, it's what's usually called a, um, a flash or a double flash generator. And you're just spraying that water that was at super high pressure um, and it instantly flashes to steam because now it's at low pressure at the surface of the planet. So no other energy inputs are needed. It's just physics. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Thanks, Danielle. I love the wrap up. It's just physics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like most like, things. <laughs> my little guy today was wearing a shirt or something that says, it's just rocket science. That always just makes me laugh. <laughs> I hope it inspires some conversations like that in the future. Um, okay, we had another kind of technical question along those lines. Um, let's see. What liquids or additives other than water are used in geothermal energy? And are there any environmental concerns? Yeah, um, nothing else really is, is added in some geothermal power production. The water that is used is seawater. Um, there are some places in Iceland where they're, it's not like they're drilling into the ocean to get hot water from the ocean. They're drilling down into the earth, but it's in an area close to the coast. And so at depth, 
underground, there is some mixing of salt water and regular water. And those, those systems can produce a lot more of those deposits that we looked at on the pipes. That's actually what that one at the Blue Lagoon is. That's one reason why the Blue Lagoon has so many dissolved materials in that water is because it actually has a lot of seawater and seawater just has a lot more stuff in it. Um, the same thing can kind of go depending on the region where you're making, you know, putting your geothermal power plant, the rocks at depth might contribute different materials to that water. That's all natural, whatever's existing in that area. Uh, we aren't adding anything to the water when we build geothermal power plants. Um, the one thing that can be added when I talked about EGS, enhanced geothermal, and that's where you're sending water down um, under high pressure to create fractures. That sounds a lot like fracking for oil and gas. And um, the process is very similar, but the end results are very different. So in the oil and gas industry, they pump water down at high pressure. And in that water is um, some chemicals and the chemicals are there to create just the right consistency of the water so that they can have sand or small, small particles of plastic um, uniformly suspended in this fluid. So they have water, but then the chemicals kind of change the viscosity of the water so that you can suspend these particles. That's why you hear about chemicals in fracking. They need the chemicals in order to get just the right consistency to keep those particles. They don't want all the sand at the bottom and the rest all water. They want it all equally suspended. So they send down that whole mess and that fractures the rock and the particles, the sand or whatever it is that they sent down in that slurry, fill in the fracture and hold the fracture open. And that provides a pathway for oil and gas to come out, migrate out through that fracture, and then they can pump it up the well. In geothermal, it's very different. We don't want the fractures held open. We want tiny little hairline fractures so that as much water as possible can percolate through those cracks. So there is no need to send particles down. And since there's no need to send particles, you also don't need any chemicals because the chemicals, the sole purpose of the chemicals is to perfectly suspend the particles. <laughs> um, so since you don't need the particles, you just send the water down under high pressure and the pressure fractures the rock. And then the rock settles back down on itself, which is exactly what you want. Um, we have a future physicist here listening to all this. <laughs> and, um, and then that, that water just percolates around and heats up. So nothing is sent down with it. I hope that that answered that question. No additives. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, and you started to answer another question that had also come in to just looking at the difference between the fracturing of rock for EGS and then the fracking for fossil fuel extraction. And I think you got into that. I don't know if there's anything else specifically you'd want to ask or answer or add with that question, but I know you started to get at that. Yeah, um, I'll just pop back in here one more time and um get an image up. This is what fracking looks like for oil and gas. There's a deep well that's drilled. Oh, I'm sorry. A deep well that's drilled, that slurry of chemicals and particles and water is sent down. It creates fractures. The fractures are held open and oil and gas migrates into those fractures, into the well, and then is pumped back out. Um, and then the wastewater is a problem that has all those chemicals in it. And it used to be in the oil and gas industry that the wastewater was dumped into a pit and then it was hauled away by trucks and taken to a treatment plant for wastewater. Now what is happening is that wastewater is more likely injected into a shallow well. It's not injected way down deep in here. It's injected into a shallow wastewater well and that is what's generating the earthquakes that you hear about in fracking. And those earthquakes are felt by people and they can cause some damage. They can be in the magnitude four range, which isn't enough to cause you know, damage to buildings, but definitely you would feel the shaking. So when you hear about earthquakes that are generated from the oil and gas industry, it's because of the wastewater injection wells, these shallow, shallow wells. There isn't one that exists on this image. This image just shows the old way of doing it, which is put the water in a pit, transfer the water out to a, a water treatment plant. Now that's not happening. It's just injected into a shallow well. So the in oil and gas industry, the fracking process doesn't generate earthquakes that we can feel. It's the wastewater injection process that does. Uh, for enhanced geothermal systems, there is no wastewater injection. It's just pumping down water, opening up those fractures, and then letting water heat up. And so 
The earthquakes that are generated in EGS are these very deep, very small earthquakes. They're not like the wastewater injection earthquakes in fracking, right? Uh, I don't know if there was a question actually about that, but that is one thing that comes up quite often um, mm -hmm. as a question for enhanced geothermal systems. So I just thought I would uh, address that. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, and it is really helpful to have some of these visuals too to be able to start to pull this information together. <laughs> Um, okay, so I also have a question here for Josh. Uh, so how does one go about assessing their geothermal potential? So for example, if a municipality were to explore uh, their geothermal possibilities, where would they get started? And then what kind of resources uh, would there be? Uh, yeah, so as I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna repeat my, my previous disclaimer that I, I'm really not, um, super knowledgeable and an expert uh, in, in this area. Um, Dr. McKay probably has a, a better answer than me, but um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think it usually starts with, you know, knowing that you're in a, a region with a good, you know, geothermal resource that might manifest on the surface with some type of hot spring or, you know, geyser, or that type of, um, of expression. Um, and then, so that may be an area where where you're likely to to be able to get hotter water with a shallower drilling. Um, and uh, so it does involve drilling, uh, I, I I believe, um, you know, test wells to sort of test the water. And um, as as I as we heard about the 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 permeability um, of you know, the basin that, and trying to um, characterize the, the um, reservoir that, that may be available. Um, so that's pretty expensive work and, um, you know, involves drilling and, and you never know how those, those test wells are, are gonna, gonna work out before you drill them. So it, that's why I said it's, it's more speculative um, as, as a, you know, a renewable, a resource to develop it. Um, so yeah, we we would be available um, to help fund those types that type of work though. Um, you know, we, with our project development assistance, that's something that would qualify for that. And we, um, you know, we just require that it um, it's done by a qualified third party um, consultant just to avoid any conflicts of interest. Um, and then we um, we provide that fifty percent cost share on a reimbursement basis up to, you know, $200,000 per project. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that's probably a drop in the bucket for developing a geothermal project, but that's, that's what we have available. So um, I, I would, I, I would probably ask Dr. McKay to correct any, anything that I said there <laughs> that was incorrect. Yeah. Well, kind of as a follow-up to that, um, there was another question that was asked, um, what is the potential scale in Oregon and how would Deschutes County stack up in terms of um, feasibility or heat at depth here? Uh, I don't know if you have any insight on that, Dr. McKay. Um, yeah, there's been, so there's the map that I showed, you know, that kind of shows the, the heat at depth. And that's really, at kind of the deeper end of, of the wells that we're drilling. Most geothermal is at much more shallow wells than that. And so to really get the answer of, you know, do we have temperatures that are high enough for these different types of geothermal power plants? Um, just kind of exactly what Josh was saying, you, you just have to do some exploration and, and drill wells and see where heat exists. And here in Central Oregon, there have been a few wells drilled up in the Cascades, and that was, um, you know, kind of in the early 80s. And since not much has been done with that, I think that most people are pretty much on board with not developing uh, geothermal power plants in uh, the high Cascades area. I mean, certainly not in wilderness, but even in, in most of the, you know, lower elevation areas that just hasn't really been on the table in Oregon. Um, the other place in central Oregon where quite a few wells have been drilled is Newberry Volcano. And that again was in the, a lot of those were in the 80s and that prompted actually the designation of Newberry as a national monument. Um, it was really kind of the geothermal power exploration, um, forest service, BLM, some of the different land management agencies and then local um, groups in Bend who were concerned about geothermal power production 
you know, at Newberry, all came together um, and drew up a boundary, a monument boundary. And um, there's no geothermal development or exploration within the boundary and outside of the boundary there is. So there have been wells drilled outside of that monument boundary um, and inside before it was designated as a monument. And we do have the heat source, um, certainly for binary power production. Um, that's where you use the working fluid. Um, and for EGS, what EGS really does is enhanced geothermal systems is it really, because you're uh, fracturing the rock, it, it isn't just heat. You know, we talked about geothermal reservoirs. It isn't just heat that you need. You also need fractured rock and you need water. And in, enhanced geothermal systems or EGS gives you the ability to produce that anywhere where hot rock exists. And so that really opens up not only most of central Oregon, but really huge parts of the United States, it means that you can bring geothermal power plants to urban areas instead of this question of, you know, developing them out in, um, in areas that are really maybe should be left natural. Um, so we do have that potential here for sure, especially when we start talking about enhanced geothermal systems and deep drilling that's going down, you know, several kilometers, six, eight kilometers. Um, which is, you know, several miles. Yeah, I love that idea of thinking about like, how could you actually do this in an urban setting and what's possible as we look at making that transition to a renewable future, um, having lots of possibilities on the table is definitely gonna be really important, uh, especially possibilities that don't um, interfere with the natural landscape as much too, so. Yeah, I, um, I would just, had a quick comment too that um, ha having that located near you know the population centers also creates more potential to um, use that thermal energy in a useful way for district heating or you know that that type of application. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good um, follow up, um, Josh. There was a a note that was posted in the Q and A. Um, so somebody was saying that in the community where they live, they've tapped a shallow legacy well to create a geothermal loop that is running geothermal heat pumps uh, to each of the homes and businesses. And um, they're wondering if there are many other projects like this going on or are there funds to develop projects like that. And if we need to get into more detail, I can also send that out in our um, follow up email. Yeah, with, with Energy Trust, um, I, I'm not aware of, of any of that. Um, like I mentioned, that limitation within our um, program um, is, you know, for renewable generation. Um, so, you know, that, and then there may be something with, with efficiency and I, you know, I can look at into that and try to connect um, whomever with, with the right person um, at Energy Trust to see if there's any, any efficiency um, incentives or, you know, programs that they could participate in with that. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to put my um, my email address in the, the chat and feel free to contact me and we'll follow up later. Um, and they had just also added in the chat too. Yes, that's definitely the efficiency side of things, not generation, but definitely a really um, creative use of um, that geothermal potential that we have. So all right, well, I'm going to um, wrap up here. I invite you all to um, post any other questions you have and we can try to address those in our follow-up email. I was also going to say that um, Danielle and a group um, that she works with the Central Oregon Geosciences Society had a really great talk last week with somebody, um, a scientist from the Newberry Project. And Danielle, is there a recording of that event that I could share? with folks. I'll share that in case folks are interested in learning more about what's been explored here in Deschutes County out at Newberry because they did a really good um, in-depth presentation looking at some of those possibilities as well. Um, so I just wanted to um, share this last call to action here for folks uh, that if you're interested in getting involved at all with the Environmental Center, um, you can get involved in a variety of ways by attending events like this and joining the conversation. Um, you can volunteer at other upcoming events. We have the Earth Day Fair coming up and are looking for lots of volunteers for that event, um, as well as becoming a member. And I'll send out information on all of, all of those opportunities as well. And then 
Um, a few other upcoming events that we have, we'll be continuing this homegrown renewable series with a biomass event in April, and those uh, details will be released soon, as well as learning about how you can go solar with community solar and get subscribed to projects. Um, and then we also have the Earth Day Fair at the end of April, which is a really fun celebration in downtown Bend with a parade through Bend, as well as uh, lots of great information and organizations to connect to. And then I'm really excited about this last bit. We're partnering on an event with Leah Thomas to do um, a be part of her book tour um, for an intersectional environmentalist. And that'll be on May 3rd. And we'll have more details about that on her website soon. So I think um, that will give us a good wrap on this evening. I invite you all to email me any other questions and see how we can um, connect you with some answers to um, get questions answered and projects started across Oregon. And uh, thank you for um, those of you who had trouble getting in here uh, today. I appreciate your, your patience um, as we worked on that glitch with Eventbrite. So thank you all for your grace with that. Okay, I hope to connect with each of you soon. Have a good night.